So welcome everyone to Tuesday's Writers and Readers Series here at the Rosemont Writers Retreat for June 2019. I'm very thrilled to have back uh, once again this year Curtis Smith. Curtis Smith, speaking of which, has published over 100 stories and essays. His work has been cited or included in the Best American Short Stories, the Best American Mystery Stories, Best American Spiritual Writing, the Best Short Fictions, and the W.W. W. Norton Anthology of New Micros. He, uh, was, he has worked with independent publishers to put out five story collections, four novels, two essay collections, and one work of creative nonfiction. What he really needs to do is work a little bit harder. That's what I think. I, I think he's like it's a, a little slacker. it's a little sad that you're so yeah, that your output is so small. So anyway, I'm kidding of course. Please welcome Curtis Smith. Thank you. So I'm asking uh, people weird questions this this go around and you and you know, you heard them yesterday so you have a little bit of time to prepare. I usually go first. Uh, yep, frequently you do, yes. I know, so I'm ready. I okay, think. good. No, I'm not. <laughs> All right, really not. so um, first question is courtesy of uh, Grant Clauser, who was the poetry uh, person this weekend, and he asked his students to create their own coat of arms. So I'm asking you the same question. Usually a coat of arms includes a place, an animal, and a tool. Okay, I forgot. I was trying to remember all three, but I remembered a couple. <laughs> so the animal would be an old dog, because I like old dogs. Okay. Because they get to sleep a lot and they're loyal and... So you aspire to be an old dog? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'm looking forward to that day when I can nap in the morning and nap in the afternoon. Mm, okay. <laughs> gotcha. You know, aim high. Yeah, um, exactly. Tool would probably have to be a phone because I would need to call someone instead of me doing something myself. Okay. Or just to wake you up from your naps, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't wake me up from my naps. Oh, I want to okay. go. All right. um, just because most of my home projects go awry, and about half of them I end up calling someone anyway. So okay. I'm not the most handy. Gotcha. And what was a, lot the place. a place? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I love the woods. I love to be outside. I love to be on a path. I love the mountains. So I go with that. Okay, so like maybe a tree with a little windy path. A path with a tree, no. sure. Some rocks and roots. Nice. Yeah. So do you have any authors that you would fanboy over? I met Richard Ford last year, and I was totally tongue-tied. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think people, you, you know them through the page. Mm -hmm. And seeing them in person is different. Yeah. And oftentimes you get a little fanboyish there. You know. Vonnegut, I would feel that way about. Sure. Um, like, who wouldn't feel that way? Yeah, I know. Him? I know. Margaret Atwood, you know. So, what's the last book you read? Yeah, I'm reading The French Lieutenant's Woman. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm a super slow reader. Mm. Like, last summer I read Grapes of Wrath. And literally, it took me like all summer. Because mm. I, only, I only read a couple pages at a time. Because it's Steinbeck and it's 400 pages long. Yeah. So, and, yeah but I, that I need to put it down and I need to think about it. And I need to, like, a lot of times I'll reread, mm -hmm. like, the same page again. Oh, how did he do that? And I'm not the most, it's hard to get to the end sometimes. Yeah. But I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of interviews with authors. So I do a right, lot of reading right, of current right. stuff. Um, I just read a bunch of, of Anne Sexton. I kind of mm -hmm. get back into her poems. I, I teach a class where I have to, like, reread certain pieces of literature. Right. So I read a lot of that, you know, this past semester. Right. Okay. I know the answer to this question already, but I'm going to ask it. Plant, uh, planter, plotter, or pantser? Planner, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I shared this with my group yesterday, that my process. And, you know, I tried, I'm, I'm trying new things now. It's like right now, instead <coughs> of a story collection, I'm writing a novella collection. Um, I'm trying to plan out like a YA thing just for something new. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'll, oh, I'll try pantsing. And it just deteriorated into planning uh, right away. Mm -hmm. But for, for me, it, you know, it's not really a, a regimented thing. Like, I find a lot of creativity mm -hmm. in that planning process. Um, oftentimes when I imagine a character, they're two-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And through that, like, I'll, I'll take months to plan a novel. And I have to see it all the way through. And, and through that, I see, I, I see the emotional depths of my characters. Mm -hmm. I understand their motivations a little more. Um, 
and I also do it because it, it, it frees me up to, to really focus on the language mm -hmm. when I write. So I, I'm a really sentence-heavy person. I think my style is very, you know, sentence-oriented. And oftentimes when I write, I can only write three or four sentences at a time, and then I got to get up and like rub my head, and, because I'm I'm thinking. It, it, so it allows me to separate the thought of what's happening mm -hmm. with like the art of what it sounds like right. on the page, and that's just what works for me. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not pushing that on anyone else, but I do like to share it and allow people to steal. So, do you have a go-to craft book? I've used um, the Stephen King book. Mm. on writing mm -hmm. and I'm not a huge Stephen King fan but to hear him talk about writing and to read that book it, it's really a, a good nuts and bolts sort of thing um, when in my you know when I first started writing John Gard during the art of fiction was mm -hmm. a big one for me mm -hmm. uh, that helped me a lot um, but outside of that I don't do too many craft books to be honest mm -hmm. so I'm looking forward to hearing your read I'm sure everyone else is too so right. I'm gonna Turn it over. Turn it over to you. Okay. Rain stung Eli's face. The horn's wail crowded his thoughts. The tavern's sign creaked upon its hinges. Eli clutched his coat's collar tight to his neck. His athlete's gait expedient, economical. Across the lot, the tavern's lit windows, neon in rippling puddles. The door of the car that had pulled into the lot was open. A light shone on an empty interior. A young woman peered through the cracked windshield of the other car. She ran to Eli. Her shoes splashed through the puddles. She clutched his arm, her grip strong. He's hurt. A balding man inside the other car, a hand to his forehead, blood between his fingers. Eli tugged the handle. The door stubborn at first, then opening with a groan. Eli crouched. He smelled gas, or thought he did. He reached across and slid the key from the ignition. The horn continued to blare. Are you okay? The man considered Eli, the blood on his palm. Splintered light upon his face. The woman sobbed. The rain had matted her hair. Blonde strands clung to her forehead. I'm sorry, she sobbed. I'm so sorry. Eli touched the man's shoulder. Can you move? We'll go inside and get some help. He turned to tell the woman to call the police. Words cut short by Mark, who now stood by his side. Eli thought of gas, blood. I told you to wait. Is he okay? the boy's hood a halo around his face. The bleeding man set foot upon the macadam. Eli helped him up. In the man's body a feeble current, a child's strength. Mark held the hem of his father's coat. A gust blew the hood from the boy's head. The man listed and Eli nudged him in the right direction. The crunch of glass beneath their shoes rain mixed with blood, a pink stream coloring the man's face. Where was my airbag? The man touched his gash. They reached the entrance steps, a patch of light, an awning shielding them from the rain. Mark ran ahead and opened the door. Imagine the tavern inside, a stormy night, a hunkering down, no one looking for trouble. A muted football game on the TV, a college far away. TV light captured in half-filled whiskey bottles. On the bar, overlapping circles, rings left by wet glasses, murmurs, quiet laughter. Enter a man who just left minutes before, his face now bloodied. A child, a sobbing woman calling the police. The bar was long and the narrow space funneled attention to the group gathered just inside the door. Eli guided the injured man into a chair. What happened? The people asked. What can we do? The waitress then the bartender looked out the door and studied the damage. Novice caregivers rushed forward, well-intentioned, a wealth of tipsy opinions. 
A man and a woman debated the treatment for shock. The back bar mirror doubled the commotion. The jukebox switched from one country song to another. At the bar's end, a doorway, an entrance to the tavern's restaurant. Eli spoke to the bartender, the man too dazed to provide details, the woman inconsolable. Behind the bar, Eli washed his hands, blood on his jacket's cuff. The owner sat with the man, towels pressed against the wound, a gash smaller than Eli had expected. Still, the blood flowed. Eli stepped from the bar, his son no longer by the bleeding man's side. In Eli, a skip like the hum of hydroplaning tires. He scanned the bar, the faces of strangers. Then he spotted Mark by the corner's neglected video game. The boy rose onto tiptoes and tested the joystick. The screen blinked. Eli placed a hand on the boy's shoulder. Together they passed the entrance to the adjoining room. Eli glanced in, tables and booths, huddled conversations, waitresses laden with plates, the clinking of silverware, the scent of grilled meat. He heard her first, unmistakable, not the words but the tone, the responding twinge in his sinew. She was not loud. Indeed, beneath the bar's jukebox and agitated voices, she could barely be heard. Still, he heard. Eli, all six two of him, the princess, her voice the P. He followed the sound to a corner booth. Her black hair frizzed by rain, the oak-colored turtleneck he bought her last Christmas. She reached across the tabletop. A man's hands met hers his face hidden by the booth's high back. The din fell away, the music gone, the voices gone, even hers. Eli stood alone, so alone he could barely move, his next step bound to send him tumbling, a betrayal of earth in his place upon it, poison in the air, dust in his lungs. Basketball had been his sport, but in high school he played JV football his temperament too timid one minute, too crazed another, the proper balance lacking. On the field he'd been laid out, a concussion, busted ribs. This pain was different. This pain erupted from within, a shattering born from knowledge. The boy, he thought, the boy. His son's small hand lost in his. Eli wove through the crowd. The boy rubbernecked a final peak as they passed the bleeding man. Outside, rain, the cutting wind, Eli's shoes sloshed through the lot's puddles. Ripples and the wetness found his feet. His heart hurled against his ribs, his breath a series of flimsy clouds tattered by the drops. The damaged cars remained where he'd found them. The stuck horn bleated the pulse of hazard lights multiplied in the shattered windshield. Dad? Mark asked. Sirens in the distance. Eli herded the boy into the car. Dad? Not now. His choked words forced him back into a moment that was not theirs alone. He breathed, greedy and wild, fighting a dry land suffocation. He started the car and circled to the lot's rear. There, his wife's car. He stopped, rolled down the window. In the distance, a siren's wail. Beside her car, the van belonging to the electrician who'd rewired their house last spring. Dad? Eli punched the gas. His tires spun, a, valley, a volley of gravel. Shh, the sound of rubber over water. Shh the song of their millimeters thin lifting from the earth. His window down, cool air and stinging drops. In a quarter mile, the police cruiser speeding the opposite way, strobes blazing. The bloody shine captured in Eli's car. Within a mile, an ambulance. Eli gunned the engine. He embraced the elements of physics, the speeds pull on his body, the winds howl. They crossed the creek bridge. 
in the darkness the rising waters a current destined to have its way dad he couldn't answer the mechanics of speech and breathing incompatible then the lights of their small town streets he knew by name their neighborhood playground mark's school home eli had no thought beyond his return but as he pulled to the curb he was overcome by emptiness he cut the engine rain drummed the roof a sycamore leaf fell onto the windshield the brown stalks of summer flowers in the garden the ragged hedge he should cut before winter the dining room light shone in the dark rectangles of white and within glimpses of the walls he painted last year the color kate had picked and then didn't like in his heart the sting of exile a disconnection from all that was warm and familiar and good dad inside eli said hand in hand they sprinted to the front door the grass soggy the key jabbed at the lock the door swung back and they hurried into the foyer mark kicked off his boots do you think the man with the cut is okay eli paced cold drops down his neck shivers across his skin his fingers traced appliances and countertops attesting of what was real he wandered room to room floor to floor all of it known <clears throat> all of it the most tangible aspect of himself the things he gathered and hauled home he had the receipts the owner's manuals all of it now twisted all of it a lie are you going to take off your coat dad he shepherded the boy to the living room he gave him a juice box a handful of pretzels mark commandeered the remote a few clicks and the boy returned to his favorite video a squirrel in the leaves a hawk swooped talons spread eli tried to sit but he couldn't his shoes squeaked over the hardwood he clenched his teeth he banged his fist against his chest rage coiled in his gut in his muscles and joints he struck his chest again harder this time the pain distant in his brain heat and static he retreated to his bedroom the rain louder here the roof overhead he locked the door on the bed the clothes she changed out of jeans a blouse there was a mirror the one he looked into every morning a different man waiting now eli stared until his breathing settled here i am he thought here i am his fury a burning star a fire at the center of a cold universe in the closet he stepped over the comforters and sweaters waiting to be pulled out for winter his hands searched the top shelf shoe boxes tumbled around him a mounting heap of boxes and lids of sandals and pumps and flats then the shoe box unlike the others he lifted the lid peeled back the brown paper the revolver swaddled like a babe in a crib the box slid from his fingers here was the sole possession left him by his derelict father a gesture that had stumbled into prophecy in the back of a dresser drawer three bullets waited in a faded cardboard box the bullets slid into the chambers a snug and perfect embrace a picture on the dresser a framed moment him kate and mark smiling on a beach eli slapped the cylinder into place he rested the gun against his cheek the metal slid over his wet skin how stupid he'd been his trust a clown's disguise as his wife spread her legs for another man the doorknob twisted his warped reflection in the dot in the knob's metal dad watch your show mark the knob jiggled again dad eli closed his eyes please watch your show son can I come in dad another test of the knob where's mom he buried the gun in the back of the sock drawer and opened the door mark remained outside the door frame around him the hallway dark 
In his eyes, confusion, a calculating of what was and wasn't important. In his eyes, the hurt of a boy witnessing his father unhinge, an echo of the child Eli had been. Eli knelt, a graceless fall. Pain radiated from his knees. He embraced the boy, a hug too tight. The smell of him, and Eli remembered how he leaned over the boy's crib, the baby's scent unlike any other. Now the tears, sobs he couldn't swallow back, another betrayal, a breaking deep inside. An echo in the foyer, a jiggle of a key in the front door lock. Mark pushed himself away. He studied his father as if he'd been speaking a new language. Mom, Mark cried, bounding down the stairs. Eli lingered on each step, the scene coming to him a frame at a time. Kate hung her coat in the foyer and kicked off her boots, Mark rodeo hugging her waist. Another step. She offered a smile. Her smile had been his miracle, his refuge. A final step. He'd known her sad history before their first kiss. He pursued her with opened eyes. He'd followed his heart that compass of fools. He made true the daydreamer's role he'd harbored since childhood, the rescuer, the peacemaker, the soother of wounds, daydreams. He was a dupe, a boy in a, a, boy in a man's body. He stepped down. Say good night to your mother, Mark. Kate fluffed her wet hair. Kinky black strands branched across her shoulders. It's kind of early, Eli. The boy clung to her legs. He studied his father. To bed, Mark, now. Kate stroked her son's shoulder. Really, Eli, he hasn't even had his snack. He's had his snack. Eli grasped the boy's arm. He tried not to be rough. Mom and Dad need to talk, and you need to go to your room. You don't need to go to bed, but you need to be upstairs with your door shut. No arguing, no coming down. Mark climbed a few steps, then turned back. Up, Eli said. When his door shut, Kate turned to Eli. What's gotten into you? He snatched her wrist. Slender, the feel of bone, easy to snap. He jerked her palm upward and bunched her sweater sleeve past her elbow. Christ, Eli. Kate wriggled. Eli responded with a tug that buckled her knees. The shock in her eyes pleased him. He squeezed harder and ran his fingers over her forearm's hairless skin. The scars, narrow ridges along her veins, had faded. He grabbed her other wrist. Her pulse throbbed against his fingers. He repeated the inspection and let go. What the fuck, Eli? Mark appeared at the top of the stairs. Mom? He changed into his pajamas. A clinging fit. His thinness exposed. The bottom's already too short, the cuffs high above his bony ankles. I'm scared. I'll be up in a second, hun, Kate said, her eyes fixed upon Eli. Eli spoke, barely a whisper. Tell your mother what we saw tonight. The boy descended another stair. An accident on the way home from the store. Dad pulled over to help. It was outside a restaurant, but I don't know its name. I think mom knows where it is. Go to bed, Mark, she said, her voice as watery as the curbside's current. I like to pick elements and pick details that serve not just to paint the picture, but have some other resonance within the piece. Because like, you know, I could pick anything to describe a scene, but I, and often that comes in revision, is, is picking, oh, uh, what's better here? Would it be this thing? And even if it just plants a seed, uh, maybe it's a color. Um, maybe I'm just gonna pick sharp objects. You know, and, and that's how I think. What, what's kind of like the major motif here? I, I had a story about, a, the main thing was a swimming pool. And so I went back after I was done and I made everything blue. And I don't know if anyone noticed, but maybe at some level they did. So I think when a writer picks details, he has 
this huge wide array of things to pick from and I think you it comes to me later usually what I want to pick and I want to pick the things that will do more than just say that one thing they'll kind of paint a bigger picture what's changed in my, in my writing life is my first couple books were like novels and story collections and then I started writing like nonfiction and there's a real clear division in my work where nonfiction came in because in nonfiction I kind of discovered this different voice which is more like my voice which is more like I don't say a ton of stuff I'm kind of quiet for the most part and so it's kind of this more reserved voice and I think that comes out stylistically in, in here and I think you can my, my and I like that voice and so my my fiction changed as a result of writing nonfiction and I got into nonfiction because of a totally weird like random thing um, and, and maybe a, some advice I would give my younger self is to you know it's not all about fiction it's not all about whatever you know try poetry try nonfiction and, and you'll be opened up and, and discover new things so doing that that weird thing that got me into nonfiction was, was a real you know godsend for me so I was open to that opportunity. So maybe be open to opportunities would be another thing.